And uh, what a wonderful, wonderful <clears throat> truth to know that in the midst of every storm we face, He is our anchor. He alone yeah. is yeah. our anchor. Amen. Amen. God gives us a fresh glimpse of the power and might of God. Amen. You have your Bibles if you'd like to turn with us to the book of Zechariah. That's where we're going to begin. Zechariah. Uh, that's page 935. <laughs> and uh, if it's not there, keep looking. It's in that vicinity. And uh, Zechariah is where we're going to be looking. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But it has been a, a joy, a delight to be here thus far. And thank the Lord for his presence. We've sensed in their services and the time of fellowship, enjoying it and getting to know you all. And uh, I feel like I'm, I'm a tag along as my wife is telling me who you are and who this one is and how this one relates to that one and, and uh, how this one's mean and this one's... <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, it is a joy to get to know you. And uh, I, our prayers are with Brother and Sister Saxton. I know they really, really want to be here. Hmm. And um, they're special people to us. As uh, Brother Saxon, along with Brother James Plank, married us 25 years ago uh, mm -hmm. in June. And uh, so they're very special to us. Trusting the Lord to help us tonight with a truth that God's uh, just been uh, reminding me of. And uh, entitled the message, From Spiritual Deficiency to Spiritual Sufficiency. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid that... As we go along in life, if we're not careful, uh, we can we can learn how to do church. Does anybody else feel like we can do that fairly easy? Mm -hmm. We can learn how to do it. Uh, we can learn what to say and when to say it. Our order of services don't change a whole awful lot, and, and that's a good thing. We're supposed to do things decently and in order. I believe that there's something beautiful about the order and in, in our services. But uh, if we're not careful, we can learn to do not only church collectively, but we can learn to do spiritual things. Uh, and, and if we're not careful, we can find ourselves attempting to do it in our own strength and in our own self. I mean, we have convention after convention. We have three-day conventions. We have weekend conventions of how we can build churches and how we can better run churches and how we can reach lost people and how we can... Uh, better host people, and I mean, how we can be better leaders. I mean, those are good things. Don't get me wrong. We need those things. Amen. We do need those things. We we should never settle to do things just haphazardly. We need to do our very best in all that we do for Christ. And those things are beneficial to us. But if we're not careful in the learning of how to do things better, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves attempting to do those things in our own strength. And when it's all said and done, we might be able to build a church. We might be able to have a, a good crowd. We might be able to have people walk out the doors and say, wow, I really enjoyed that service. I really enjoyed our time here. And, and we might be able to have people in the community say, oh, you ought to attend uh, Lake Placid. Yeah, I'm going to just start naming names here because I'm new. I'm trying to learn them all. You could be in Brushton or or uh, Haverhill? Haverhill. Haverhill, see? I'm learning. I'm, I'm new to the conference. Please forgive me. Haverhill. Uh, and uh, it, it could be uh, Schenectady. It could be any of, you know, oh, it's just wonderful to be uh, part of that church. And, and we can hear a lot of good things, and we can hear a lot of positive things. And if we're not careful, we can feel pretty confident in ourselves, thinking, you know what? There's people who like us. There are people who want to enjoy our church. They want to come to our church. They, they want to fellowship with us. And they want to be part of our lives. And we're glad for that. And we can just sometimes, you've never felt this way, but I'll just be honest, I have felt myself in this place a time or two, where we just think, you know what? God is good. Things are going well. And when it's all said and done, if you just stop for a moment, you realize that we have been doing a whole lot of good stuff in our own strength. Hmm. And while I want to have churches where people in our communities are happy to be part of, that should always be a very high priority of our churches. We want to be a light and salt in our community. But if we do not have the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. hmm. we are just doing non-essential things. Hmm. Because the reality of it is, 
As a pastor, I cannot. As parishioner, you cannot. Not one of us has the power or the ability to see biblical transformation in hearts and lives that really, really is necessary for us to have eternal effect. Not earthly success, but eternal success. If that's going to be happening, it will not be because of you. It will not be because of me. It will be for one reason only, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit has brought it to pass. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. As, as pastors, as church people, we can, we, can, we can tell people what we believe, why we believe, and why we should, and why we shouldn't. But if we don't have the Holy Spirit working through us to help those people understand that this is not just what the church says. This is not just what Brushton Church is saying or Schenectady Church is saying or uh, East Wooster. Is there still church East Wooster? Is there? No. No? Okay. Well, then uh, let's move on. Haverhill? Haverhill. Haverhill. See, I'm going to keep saying this until I get it right. Haverhill, you know, it's not just what we are saying you have to do to be a Christian. What you need to do because the reality of it is, really what you and I say really doesn't matter. What does God say and how does the Holy Spirit bring it to our, our attention, bring it to our thoughts and our, and our minds and our hearts that we might grasp it and then we might shape our life in accordance to his word. That, my friend, we can talk to people and people can do this and people can do that, but all they've done is join a club. Mm -hmm. And folks, we don't need more clubs. We need churches that are Amen. filled with, with the power of the Holy Spirit that can be transformational in families. I still believe that the power of the Holy Spirit has the ability to transform not only dads and moms, but families. Mm -hmm. We can still see families brought together, uh, salvaged in changes until they're a, a pillar in a church in their community. Mm -hmm. And that will not be because you as a pastor are a good speaker, you as a lay person are a good giver, or you as a lay person are a good uh, go out on Saturday knock on door person, it'll be because the divine Holy Spirit shows up and makes all the difference in the world. Amen. If we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, we still have some deficiencies. But I'm so thankful that he gives us an answer. And he says that you can have my spirit, and you can have it in your, his fullness, and we can have spiritual sufficiency through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. After the Jewish people experienced exile in Babylon, King Cyrus of Persia was allowing, I think it was 50,000 or so of them to return to Jerusalem and build the temple under Zerubbabel, the governor of Jerusalem. And at that time, Zechariah, a prophet and a priest of Israel, received several visions of the Lord. If you've read that passage of Scripture, you're aware of it. And it is in one of those visions that God delivers this key message that goes like this. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, in this period of Israel's history, the prophets Zechariah and Haggai, they were both ministering, and they kind of had a dual ministry going on. While Haggai was encouraging the return of the Jewish exiles to go work and rebuild the kingdom and the temple, Zechariah was urging them to repent of their sin and renew their covenant with God. And I, I want to say that both of these are essential. Both of these are important. What Haggai is saying and Zechariah are saying, they're not, they're not pulling apart from each other or, or fighting against each other. They both are essential. If the temple is going to be rebuilt, it's going to take people to get in there and do it. But on the other hand, there was a, a Zechariah who was saying, you can build it all day long, but you also need to renew your covenant so that when it is built, it's more than just a modern statue of that day or a modern ooh and aahing of that day, but it is a place, it is a powerful place, Amen. and that renewal was just as important as the physical going and building. Mm -hmm. And I just remind us in our modern day context of that, we do need to be proactive in sharing the gospel. We do need to make the house of God the best that it can be. And we do need to do our part. 
But we also need to be in constant contact with God Almighty that he can continually refresh us and refill us and renew us that when the people walk through our doors or when we go out into a world that is lost, that we're not just flat, but we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can make a difference. If the spiritual element is missing, all is in vain. We can build churches. I think it's proven across our nation. People are intelligent people. People are smart. They're creative. They have all sorts of ideas, good ideas. We can build churches and we can build kingdoms. But what we cannot do in ourselves is we cannot breathe into people, lost humanity, the life-giving spirit of God. That's right. Only he can do it. Amen. But if we will be filled with the spirit, he can use us as instruments to bring the two together. Both elements are important. Go build, but at the same time, let there be this spiritual renewal. The spiritual renewal is going to be essential to their survival and worship of God once that temple was rebuilt. Construction of the temple, which had been stopped by opposition from neighbors, had resumed under the leadership of uh, and the exhortation of Zechariah and Haggai. Zechariah experienced a series of night visions, and in the fifth one, he saw a solid gold lampstand. Two olive trees provided the lampstand with oil supply, which flowed through two golden pipes. You can read about it in Zechariah chapter 4, and the text in which we have just read, uh, that we're getting ready to read again. The key passage of the vision is contained in those words of verse 6. It's not by might nor by power, but my spirit. The work of rebuilding the temple would only be accomplished by God's spirit, not by human power. Mm -hmm. Friends, if God would just help us to understand, it's not in you or me. It's not in New York Pilgrim. It's not in God's missionary, Allegheny, Bible Methodist. It's in God and God alone. Yes. There's always going to be opposition. There was opposition uh, in their day, there's always going to be opposition going forward. But friends, can I just remind us, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is in us, who is more powerful than him? Who is? No one, friend. We, we as individuals can see the kingdom of God built. We can see the kingdom of God enhanced if we will humble ourselves and allow him, the Holy Spirit, to fill us and use us. In Zechariah 4, the word might, it's not by might, is often translated as an army or a force, a nobility or efficiency. And it, is, it really is associated with human resources. Mm -hmm. It relates to the financial means and, and can be connected to wealth. And, and uh, you know, we do need financial means. We do need people to give and we do need that. <clears throat> but may I just remind us that our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Mm -hmm. And God has a way of bringing things to pass that would just blow our minds if we would just get away from the fact and thinking that it's all reliant on my wealth or my giving. And we need to give. But ladies and gentlemen, God's will, God's work will always be done with God's supply. We can trust him, but we've got to understand it's not me. It's not you. It is God and God alone. Amen. So he's saying, it's not by might. The word power implies the, the purposeful force, a firm resolve, dynamic strength, and resoluteness. Mm -hmm. But he says, it's not by might, nor by power. It's not by their own abilities, their plentiful resources, or their fierce determination. We've heard a lot about that. We just need to be determined. We just need to be committed. Yes, we do. But friends, all of our determination, as we're going to see in a moment, really amounts to nothing if we don't have the power of God in us. Mm -hmm. God's people build the temple. None of these things would build God's temple and send God's light into the world. It was going to be only through the Spirit of the Lord that their work and their worship would become a light spreading to all the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, the Holy Spirit, go there, and on that day, when, when, when you're there waiting, on that day, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Hmm. And do what? And give you power. Amen. And from that point, 
Then you will go and be my witnesses into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to all of the other parts of the world. He didn't send them out by themselves. He didn't send them out first. Before they went out, what was it? He said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to tarry. And when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be filled with power. The answer to, to a, a life well lived the answer to, to a success in our personal lives spiritually, in our families, in our churches, the answer is the same whether you're in the Adirondack camp, whether you're in Penn Street camp that will be going on simultaneous with this, or whether it will be in a revival in your church this fall. It makes no difference where you will be. The answer is the same for every single one of us. Amen. Nobody has a corner of the market. God is for all and for whosoever will. And if we, no matter who we are, will just allow him, the Holy Spirit, to have full access to our hearts and our lives, it'll transform our churches, it'll transform our homes, and friends, whether we want to believe it or not, it will impact our communities. Yeah. It's something greater than any barbecue we can have. I love barbecues. I love block parties. I like doing anything and everything we can to get people in. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you something. Nothing will bring people closer to God than the power of the Holy Spirit. As the physical labor of rebuilding the temple was done, a spiritual renewal was taking place. Joshua, the high priest of Zerubbabel, were not, listen, they were not to trust in financial resources or military prowess but in the mighty power of God's Spirit, working through them. It says, it's not by force or strength, but my Spirit says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Amen. He's in control of them all. He's in uh, order of them all. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone in the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless him. May God bless him. Amen. You know, God made a similar promise to those who remain faithful to him in Hosea's day. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 7, he says, But I show love to the people of Judah. I will free them from their enemies. Listen, not with weapons, not with armies, not with horses, not with chariots, but by my power as the Lord their God. Amen. Oh, those other things that we think are so important are so minimal, so trivial to God. I don't need those things. I just need me, he says. Hmm. The I am that I am says, I just need me. Amen. Zerubbabel needed not be discouraged by human limitations or afraid of earthly obstacles. Neither uh, should present day Christians. Neither should you or me. Amen. When God calls us to a purpose, his spirit fills and equips us to complete it. And as the Apostle Paul learned, human weakness is no obstacle because God's power is perfected in it. That is why he said, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we get to the point we understand, I am nothing and it is all him. Friends, when we recognize he doesn't need you, he doesn't need me. We're going to get to that later in the week. But friends, he doesn't need us. He doesn't. He's all sufficient, God. Amen. When we can get to that place, mm -hmm. in our weakness, we find we're strong. Amen. Our decisions about living victorious and living in the power of uh, the transformation grace, uh, transformational grace of God, and, and sharing that, our decisions should never be based on human abilities. Or human limitations, but always in light of the power of Almighty God. So, if your Bibles are still open, if you'd like to flip over to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew, chapter 26. I want us to look at a, 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 a picture of this and how this can look and how this is played out. And just a, just a way to illustrate, if you will, how in ourselves we are not sufficient. We are deficient. But through the Holy Spirit, we find sufficiency. Now, now we're going to look in at Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. You can, you can read there as, 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 uh, as you would like. 
But we're looking at a picture of pre-Pentecost Peter. There's no doubt in our minds that Peter loved Christ. Mm -hmm. Loved him. There's not a person who can argue the fact that Peter didn't love Jesus. Man, he left everything. He was following him. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful picture. Jesus said, come and follow me. And Peter left everything and went to follow him. But what I want us to see is in that in the humanity of Peter, there were always problems. Hmm. And yet even maybe sometimes a little bit of that carnality, there was, there was problems. But when Peter got to the place where he had the fullness of the Spirit in his life, it changed everything about him. Hmm. God used him remarkably. So I want us to look, look at this, these, these few points about Peter. Uh, one of the things that the story of, of Peter tells us that it is possible to have great desire in our heart to follow God, but still fail. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I hear a lot, and so do you, you know, you just have to have a desire. You have to have a desire. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have to have a desire in our heart to serve him. We have to have a desire to follow him. But I want to just remind us, it, this is more than just the power of positive thinking. It's more than just having a heart that says, uh, you know, uh, I'll follow Jesus, let, let, take the whole world and give me Jesus. And if no, no one go with me, still I will follow. Those are wonderful desires to have. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful spirit to have. But that in and of itself is not enough. Mm -hmm. It's possible to have a desire to follow God and still fail. We can see this very clearly in Peter's failure as he denied Christ, the one who loved Jesus, the one who was so adamantly for him. He denies him. You know, I, I've come to find out that it's not so much about how great a desire that we have in our heart as much as how we respond when the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. I can desire all day long to follow Jesus. But how is that desire translated when the pressure is on? Mm -hmm. The criticism is there. The persecution may begin to start to flood in. And the comments begin to build up. And, 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 you know, you feel like you're the only person standing. You know, we can have desire all day long. But how does that desire play out when the rubber meets the road, so to speak? Mm -hmm. We can have desire to follow him but still fail. Peter desired to follow Christ, and, and he made some pretty bold statements, we'll get to it in just a moment, but let us be reminded that, that as Peter was, uh, was, had denied the Lord, and, and as he had walked away, there was something that proves the desire of his heart when, when it says that uh, as he, before he, before he uh, denied the Lord, uh, they were arresting him and taking him away, Peter followed him afar off. Everybody fled. Everybody just, just just like cockroaches. They were gone. But Peter could be showing us a very clear picture of the desire of his heart because he came back. It was at a distance, but he came back and he followed Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful for anybody in this room that has a desire to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. But I just want to remind us, if we're going to see eternal transformation and eternal success in our lives, it's going to take more than just desire, or we will end up in the same boat as Peter. Mm -hmm. We need more than just that. Many of my failures in my life, I'll just be honest with you, came from that spiritual deficiency, the absence of the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Thought that I could do it. Thought that I could handle it. Thought that I could break those vices. Thought that I was strong enough to, to overcome. You know, I, I've, been, uh, I've been victory free for three months or four months or five months. And all of a sudden, I could do it. I could handle it. I had a desire to follow Jesus. But, but all of a sudden, there came a temptation at the wrong time, on the wrong place. And circumstances were not just pleasant. And all of a sudden, I found myself... Failing the very God that I said, I'll serve you as long as I can mm -hmm. with all that I have. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is, is I had a desire to follow him, but I had not experienced the power of the spirit in his fullness in my life. Amen. 
not by might, folks. It's not by power. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to stay true and if we're going to make an eternal difference, it's going to be through his spirit, says the Lord. Right. It's possible to have a desire to follow Christ but still fail. Secondly, it's possible to boldly proclaim Christ hmm. and still fall short. We live in a society today where everybody's boldly proclaiming Christ. I mean, we score a touchdown and we just, you know, just, we hit a home run and it's, you know, we, we, we do something great and we kneel wherever we are. We just, we just make a mistake. I'm not against recognizing the power of God, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just wanting us to understand that if we're going to have eternal success in our lives and in our churches, it's going to have to be more than just a desire and more than just a bold proclamation that I will follow Jesus Christ. Peter was probably one of the most impulsive people that you've ever met in your life. My wife would say that, that I, I kind of fit that mold. And I probably found myself in more trouble than I've ever needed to be in my life because I'm an impulsive person. And uh, there's been many, many, many times that the Holy Spirit has worked in my heart, worked in my, I think, I think I'm getting a little better. I think God's helping me in my impulsive. Nothing wrong with being impulsive, but uh, it does help having the Spirit leading you and guiding you in those impulses. Amen. And here's Peter. Let's look at a little bit of his resume. He had a pattern of boldly being loyal to Jesus in his bold proclamations. He was, he was one of the first that, that whenever, just in his impulsiveness, Jesus says, listen, I want you to leave everything and I want you to come and follow me. I mean, before he really understood what any of that was about, guess what he did? He just did it. He just picked up everything and he started following. There was just that sense of, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to go do it. I don't know what it is yet. don't know what it looks like, but I'm going to do it. There was a sense of impulsiveness of his spirit. You know the story. They're out there in the sea. The, the winds and waves are blowing and Jesus is not in the boat in this storm. And they're scared to death. They think they're going to die. And, and all of a sudden, at that very point of, of fear of failing and dying, they see what they think is a ghost walking on the water. And, and out there in the middle of the dark, stormy waters, there is a voice that says, Be not afraid. Be not afraid. It's me. It's Jesus. And what does Peter say? He just pipes up and says, Okay, Lord, if it's you, then just bid me to come. Tell me to come to you. And he says, Come. I mean, without thinking. He just jumps out of the boat. Mm -hmm. He was just a moment ago scared for his life. But Jesus said, Come. Okay. There's only two people in this world that I know has ever recorded being able to walk on the water. One of them was Jesus himself. The other was the apostle Peter. And you want to know why? He had but he had a desire. He had a love for Christ. And he had, he had an understanding and a faith of who and the power that he had. And he said, come. And so he just got out of the boat and started walking. Amen. But there was an impulsiveness about that. You know, the time when Jesus is talking about that he's going to go to the cross, he's going to die, he's going to be buried, but he's going to resurrect. Well, who was it that was arguing with Peter? Oh, that's not going to happen. Oh, yes, it's going to happen. No, it can't. I won't allow it. We'll, we'll not let this happen. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. That's pretty bold language. You see things from your point of view. I'm looking at them from my Heavenly Father's point of view. Mm -hmm. And for all of the, the world to have the message of salvation and have the, the gift of grace, this is what's going to happen. It's going to have to happen. And what was it? Peter was just impulsive. We'll never let anybody... But Jesus says, oh, yes, you will. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus says, every one of you will leave me. And Peter says, no, I will not. What's he doing? He's boldly making some proclamations. They might leave you, but I just want you to know I will never leave you, even if it means that I have to die. Jesus says, oh, yes, yes, you'll leave me. Everyone is going to leave. They come to arrest Jesus. Peter is there stepping between Jesus and the guard, and Malchus finds himself on the raw end of a sharp blade as his ear falls to the ground. What was it? It was the impulsive, mm -hmm. bold proclamations. This is my teacher. This is my master. This is my Lord, and you're not going to touch him. Bold proclamations. But yet, as he follows afar off, he does the unthinkable. 
Hmm. I'm just here to remind us, folks, we might think that we're stronger than we are, but we're not. Hmm. Right. Because if we're going to live successfully, eternal perspective, that is, if we're going to have churches that are effective in our communities, friends, it's not in might or in our power, but it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can have a desire to follow him and still fail. We can, it's possible to boldly proclaim and still fall short. It's possible to be courageous to our ears for Christ but still allow fear to control us when the pressure is on. Friends, I know that we want to talk a big game, and I know we want to talk a big talk about, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, you know, we should never have fear in our life. But let's just be reminded, I don't care who you are, how long you've been serving the Lord, there are times that circumstances come into our life, and fear is right there with those circumstances. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a super spiritual thing to be able to stand and say, I have no fear, because I think you lie. <laughs> because humanly, we all have this sense of fear when the storm is there. I'm glad we don't have to allow the fear to control us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can see that fear, feel that fear, and look at that fear and say, get behind me, because I know the, the maker of the rain. I know the the maker and the master of the sea. Mm -hmm. I know him. So the fear is going to come in every one of our lives. But the, rea the question that I ask is, is, is our courage as strong in the middle of the storm, and in the midst of the fear, in the midst of controversy, in the midst of, uh, of, of a, a culture that is anti-God? Or do we allow that fear to control us and push us aside and help us to be quiet and help us to compromise and help mm -hmm. us to walk away from the truth? Can I just remind us, we live in an evil, evil world. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm not being doom and gloom tonight in any way, shape, or form, but we live in a wicked world. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, if you're following the news in any way, shape, or form, and I mean, just, just about any day of the week, you read one more evil, evil mm -hmm. story some nasty stuff happened. It's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there is a mounting, there is a growing consensus among the evil, wicked sinners of our world that is growing in their anti-Christ spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only are they doing their sinful things secretly, they're now doing them publicly and celebrating them. Mm -hmm. And anyone who would ever dare say things about them. Mm -hmm. Wow. You mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you, that pressure is mounting. Mm -hmm. And it's in those moments, ladies and gentlemen, that we're not going to win a world mm -hmm. by going out there and arguing Mm -mm. Right. We're not going to win a world by going out there and telling them how dumb and stupid and evil and wicked they are. We're going to win that battle because God's on our side. Amen. First of all, that's right. We're going to win that battle because hopefully we are people who have more than just desire, more than just bold proclamations, and more than just a handful of courage. But we know. God himself and his spirit is in us and living in us and filling us and renewing us and refilling us and refilling us so that when we go out into a world, we can show the love of Christ, yeah, yeah. but yet not one time compromise on the word of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Folks, I still believe that we can be true to the word of God and do so in a way that we do not compromise one inch. And still make a difference in our world. Amen. Because when it's all said and done, it's the love of Christ that is the power of changing us. Amen. It's possible to be courage, courageous, but still allow fear. And I'm afraid. It's, it's just just uh, recently, we all are aware of of the of the vote that took place in the the U.S. and the the United Methodist Church to accept and affirm and to do such things that just just as mind-boggling and mind-blowing. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just here to remind us, we can have all the courage in the world, but when fear comes, that we might lose our tax exemption, or we might lose our, our little shelters and our little privileges, 
we can. But Lord, I want you to know that I'm yours, and I'm going to be true, and I'm going to follow you, and I can't do that myself. So how do we do that? We close by simply saying this, that it's all, we see in the story of Peter that it's also possible to really have a desire, really be courageous, really have a bold proclamation, though none go with me, still I will follow, and actually live that out. Amen. How do we do that? We find the answer in Acts chapter 2. They went into the upper room, and uh, on that day of Pentecost, it says there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind, baptizing them, filling them, cleansing them, purifying them, empowering them. It was a beautiful, beautiful day that when they walked out of that upper room, people were watching and gathering, and they realized that they must be drunk with wine or something was distinctly different about them. And Peter, guess who it was? Peter stood up and began to preach, and as he began to preach, he preached the biblical gospel, he told them exactly how it was, and in such conviction came upon them that there were those saying, Sir, oh, how can we have this? How can we enjoy this? He says, you've got to repent and be baptized. And there were 3,000 people that day repented and was baptized and added to the church, friends. That's a powerful life transformational thing that needs to happen in my life, your life, our churches, our homes. Amen. But the reality of it is it will never, never happen in our might and in our power. God is expecting us to do what he's called us to do. Mm -hmm. But he says before you go, be filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because the only way that we're going to make a difference, it's not my words or your words. It's not my message or your message. It's not your church name or my church name. Yeah. It is the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God wants to help every single one of us to be more than just professors and pro proclaimers and courageous people. He wants us to be spirit filled people yes. that we might make a difference. In our world. God, would you spare us? Would you keep us from getting comfortable in knowing how to be a Christian, in knowing how to do church? But humble us, do whatever it takes to humble us, Amen. and then allow us just to call on you, lean on you, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It'll make all the difference in the world. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Lord, sitting in this congregation here tonight are a, a great group of people, I believe, who love you and desires to serve you and and wants to have the courage within that says, though none go with me, still I will follow. But Lord, starting from the pulpit to the very last pew, would you help us just to be reminded of this truth? We can get it all figured out. We can have perfect programs and plans. We can have a growing congregation. We can have, have people all over the community just, just thrilled with our church and the community. Hmm. But oh God, are their hearts being changed? Yeah. Are their families being transformed? Are people settling it to go with you? Dear Lord, if we don't have that element, dear Lord, it's all in vain. Remind us of how weak we are and powerful you are. And may we strive to have that spirit of God in us in your fullness. And as you would help us, we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless Amen. you. You're dismissed.